Okay. ODEs. Solving them. Um, let's let's get back with it. Oops, I don't want that. Yeah. I want um this. I think I want that. No, I want this. All right. A couple words on where we're at here so far. We are on ODEs. We've done a fairly thorough job of telling you how to solve a single one, a single ODE, no matter how difficult it is, okay? We went through Euler, went through Runjakata, and, and, and we mentioned that the, the ODE 4-5 um, can solve this thing. Where is this thing? Now, and the ODE 4-5 uses a combination of fourth and fifth order Runjakata. It's very nicely written out. Okay, that's one equation. Well, how do you do more than one? That was yesterday's, that was Monday's topic. And the same thing. You've obviously got to advance two equations through time rather than one. But like ODE Euler, for instance, for two of them would simply be like that. So literally we could go to ODE Euler, add that second line. We have two things every time to put in. You have two equations to specify. You have two initial conditions. You have two of everything. You only have one time, right? Still, it's the same time shared. But uh, basically, that's the way you do it in the same time step. And it's beautiful. So that's what I'd say. I, I described it yesterday as, or Monday as that uh, it's just good news. When the problems get more complex and you get a whole bunch of them and really, really hard, the technique basically doesn't get much more difficult. A little bit more detail on how to put in more than one equation. Yes, you have that. So it's really good news and you can use this technique to solve the most difficult equation and you can solve three of them and four of them and a thousand of them. I have actually set up a code with a sequence of chemical reactions where one, one thing um, went to another with this whole sequence of these chemical reactions and um, put in like a, a thousand of them and the thing solved it just fine. So I, I probably haven't done more than that, but I know I've solved a thousand simultaneous ODs. And I can just tell you it works fine. All right, <clears throat> so let's, let's revisit that before we go on here. Um, let's go back to MATLAB where we were at last time and revisit that, then we wanna go on to the, you know, probably the most famous problem in mechanical engineering here. What we were doing last time, this is on the internet under MATLAB ODEs, you know, things there. Um, here, I guess we can. Anyway, anyway, this is on this is posted. This is exactly keystroke for keystroke what we did. I did not make one change in this since Monday's lecture. So I did this thing and that thing. But let's let's just review what we did for the uh, the function itself. I call it linear second order ODE because at this point it doesn't have an application, but um, the inputs, and this is what we're trying to solve, this guy right here. The derivative of Y1 is AY1 plus BY2 plus a source. Y2's derivative is the same sort of thing, except the different coefficients and a possibly different source. So we're trying to solve these two. What, what is it that couples these things is because Y1 the derivative of y1 has to do not only with itself, but it has to do with its buddy y2, see? So let's say you don't like y2, you know, you're y1 and you don't like y2, I don't wanna, I don't like him, he's a jerk, 
I don't want to pay attention to him. Da 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 da. I'm going to just disregard him. And by the way, I noticed there was an error that was in this one before. Plus, control save. And say you don't like Y2. Well, there's nothing you can do about it because Y2 is in your equation, it's in your grill, right? And maybe because you've had issues with Y2, maybe this is some negative kind of effect. Maybe this is a maybe something bad, negative, and maybe Y2 was messing you up, but you can't avoid it. You can't just avoid things you don't like in this world when they exist. Or similarly, if, if you know, Y2 is somebody you really like, you know, it's great to have them. You can't avoid them. Same here. So these are coupled. They have to do with each other in addition to themselves, in addition to outside sources. And being two, they need two initial conditions. So that's the, and with that, you should be able to expound upon that to do three equations, four equations, 1,000 equations. You should be able to expound to do, if this thing was a, squared or a sine of, you know, you should be able to take this example and extend it, extrapolate it to any set of ODEs that you ever see for the rest of your life. I don't know what the future holds in terms of numerical computing or the world, or good Lord, the world, but in terms of numerical computing, maybe something much more, much more um, efficient and fast, and another will come along, but assuming nothing else comes along, which is not going to be the case, what we're learning here is plenty good to solve any set of ordinary differential equations, literally, as I said, for the rest of your life, no matter how complicated they are. That is a great, great skill and a tool. I know what you're thinking. Thank you, Dr. Bickle. I'll beat you to it. You're welcome, okay? All right, now this is a, how, now how to do it, how to put it in. This is okay, let's go again. You have to put in the right, this is like a matrix equation, right? Um, is there, a, can I use a writing tool on here? Well, I don't know, I'm not good with a writing pen. Anyway, you, this, is, this is like a matrix of, of differential equations, right? Like it's a two by two matrix of equations. So you put in a function of T and Y, T is time, as normal, it's just a vector, but Y is a matrix. Y has two things. It has Y1 and Y2. Y is not just one thing. So this is how you put it in. There's the first equation. A Y of one, the first Y, plus B Y of two, plus source one. Semicolon. Not that, not that. Not, not that, that, a semicolon, so that it goes to the next row. This is a column of differential equations. There's the first one in the column. Semicolon, go to a new row, the second one in the column. If you had another one, dot, 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 you'd keep working your way down the, down the road right there. Right? And that's how you put it in. You have to do it that way because the ODE solver was written and is expecting it that way. If you put it a different way, the ODE solver will try to evaluate it and it'll come back with some kind of an error, mismatched inner dimensions or can't find something or something, you know, God knows what's wrong because it's written, ODE 4.5 is written for a function of this form. Time goes first, Y goes second, Y1, Y2, period. It's not the only way to do it, but the people at MathWorks, who are the developers of MATLAB, designed it that way. So you have to do it that way. So this is one of these things, not physics, you have to be told, and I'm telling you, that's how we do it. And then the way you call on is ODE45, you call on the equation properly, um, properly uh, formulated, a time span, the beginning and ending time, like if it was the population model, would be 1800 to, I think I ran mine out to 2200. Typically the time span is zero to something. And then the initial condition, which is how many things? Two things. 
it's initial condition one, semicolon initial condition two. And it has to be done that way. Then if, if you're willing to tolerate error using, what the hell am I doing here? I don't know, I hope I didn't mess something up. Anyway, if you're willing to, to, if you're willing to persist with this detail and be meticulous, you can solve any differential equation the rest of your life. Um, for the initial conditions, you know what, what might be nice to do is to add that in there as explanation. Y zero equals Y one zero colon semicolon Y two zero where Y one Y this is this it this has to come in that way. So let's add that as explanation. Don't be bashful about this explanation bit. And it might be nice to put a little space there. It's for viewing pleasure. There's this, there's the coupled system, there's the initial conditions. And um, if this was a physical problem, also I'd, I'd define these variables like A is some kind of a stress thing and in, in you know newtons per meter squared. And I would define more like what the physical constants were and in including their units. Source is a you know a watts per meter squared, whatever, you know. Anyway, there's where we're at so far. We started to test it and it works. We're going to turn this loose on some problems after this testing phase is over. The art of testing, you always test. You know, some people don't like this. You know, like for instance, this case one. Okay, let's let's run. All right, anyway, let's uh edit. Let's run that clear stuff. And let's run case one. Notice case one was a was minus two. So we did last time. And let's edit or run that one. There it is. Let's look at the inputs and see if this matches our intuition. First of all, the initial condition was a one and a half. And only A2 and all the S's were zero. So I think that clearly matches the intuition you should have. And, and you know, this, this idea of testing triviality, I've met with various opinions on that. I obviously think before you start to, to, to run, you should before you start to run, you should walk, but that's walking is too much, you should crawl. And before crawling, you should lift your head for the first time as a baby. I take these baby steps like this. I, I'll never forget one of, the, one, of my, one of my esteemed colleagues saw me doing one of these exercises where most of the inputs were zero and you didn't have much happening. And you know, well, you know, this, you've got really important problems to discuss. You've got the, you know, the mechanical vibrations and you've got all this da da da, you know, and, and the, you're wasting the student's time. This is this isn't kindergarten. I mean, what do you do? Do you, do you give do you give them nap time on a little rug and put their heads down? And and the person making fun of me, I said that's a good idea. We should actually maybe um, take a little break and put our heads down on, on a little carpet square. But obviously, I disagree thoroughly with this person. This is the kind of person that takes a topic and jumps into a really hard problem right away. I couldn't disagree more. Anyway, I thought that was funny. What do you think they're in kindergarten? Well, that's a good idea. Hmm. Um, we'll put them in kindergarten. We'll take them all up to advanced, advanced graduate work here right today. Um, let's look at this one. What did I do this one? I can't remember what I did. So let's look at it. Um, edit. Let's run that one. Can't remember what we put in there. Oh, a little wiggler, huh? As a matter of fact, let, let's publish what we had. Let's just publish the totality of what we had. This is nothing new. We had this on Monday. I'm just, I'm just reviewing Monday. I'm going to do new cases here in just a second. Okay. Case one. A, remember these equations here. A2 was minus two, and the rest of the stuff was zero. Over here. 
A2 was minus one and C and D were these numbers here. In other words, equation two had something to do, had to evolve negative of itself and had to do something with Y2. So these coefficients mean D is negative means Y2 decays in, in relation to itself, but C being a positive number means it grows in proportion to whatever its buddy Y1 is. So it doesn't, the, the equation two doesn't just decay. At first it grows because Y is something, see Y is giving it something. But after a while Y dies down, so it's not given anymore and then it dies down also. See, that's very interesting. Now look at this one. This is one of the more interesting cases. This is when they don't know themselves, they just know each other. Here, let's look at this case here. Can I, I can't copy and paste out of this published thing anyway, whatever. A zero and that means Y one has nothing to do with itself. It only grows directly in proportion to Y two. Similarly, Y2 has nothing to do with itself, but decays according to the other one. And that, my friends, is exactly what mechanical oscillations do. That position and velocity in, in mechanical oscillations do. They lag and lead each other, chase each other around like that. And you end up with an equation like this. You end up with a solution like that. We're going to get into more from the beginning like that. Before we go on, though, we have not tested, when we talk about testing, we need to test everything. We have not tested a source. We have not put a source in the problem. So let's do one more test and then we'll get on to mechanical vibrations. Um, so best thing is to copy and paste. Copy, paste, and we'll call this case four. Um, let's put a source in. Let's say there's a source with a one there. I don't know what that'll come out to be. I'd have to jockey with the numbers to get them right. And let's do this. Let's start both at zero. Since we have a, since we have a source, it might be nice to put both of them at equilibrium at zero. And, and they can only change if there's going to be a source. We'll put a source in one. I like that case. Um, but let's let this one die according to itself. And let's let this one die according to itself. Let me see if there's a row. All right, let's try this case. Edit. You want to just publish the whole thing? We're going to run that section. It takes long. Okay. With a source, Y1 grows. Um, let me copy the equations. I want them down there to look at them. I want them right there so I can see them and remember what A and B are. So in this case, Y decays according to itself and grows according to Y2. Y2 starts at zero and it grows according to y1. No, it no, it has nothing to do with y1 itself. But you see, there's no way for y2 to get any traction in this case. It has no source. It has nothing that's non-zero. Y2 is in equilibrium. There's nothing to knock it off, knock it off its pedestal right here. So let's put in some interaction. Let's, let's kill that term right there. Let's just put interaction with y. Let's put in zero there and one there. So this way, y2 grows in proportion to y. It has nothing to do with itself and it has no sources. Let's try that case. Run. There you go. It's a runaway problem. But you see y1 starts to grow and then y2 is growing too. So, um, I don't like that one. Let's see. Why like that? B. 
Let me do one more thing, put b equals zero. See, that thing is running away with itself. Anyway, one more time. And let's just publish the one more one thing and then we'll get on. All right. There we go. So with this last case, y1, no, it doesn't, it doesn't know anything about b. It doesn't know anything about its buddy. It, it decays in proportion to itself and it has a source. So we know from our fixed point analysis it'll grow to a one. However, it, it makes for a source for y2, which means as a y, it makes for a constant source, which means it caused y2 to run away. So this is interesting. I mean, <clears throat> there's so many special cases. You might think just two linear equations is very restrictive. Yes, it is. It's two linear equations. You're stuck with this model. But the number of applications for this particular two simultaneous ODs coupled to each other with a source, I mean, we go on and on, including the next thing we're going to do right here in a second. Um, limited, yes, but immensely, immensely practical in a lot of applications. All right. If, this, if you're building an airplane and you have a new airplane design, do you, this testing, some people ask about the testing. What is all this testing? Well, you build it. Let's say you, you're an airplane designer. You come up with a new design for an airplane. You build it, and you build the full scale airplane, and you, you uh, ask for, uh, you know, test pilots. And, you know, okay, you go out, and oh, it crashes. Oh, go darn it. Dang it. Got to go back to the drawing board. So you build another, you know, make some additions, you know, make some changes, and you build another full scale bottle of thing, and you test pilots needed. Well, you know, after a while, you know, the test pilot community gets an idea that, you know, this isn't such a good gig anymore, you know. You need to test the airplane and you need to test like the, the airfoils in a wind tunnel. You need to make tests the little components. You need to do small scale testing. The amount of testing before you build a full scale model and actually fly it with a human flying the thing is immense. You don't just do case one, two, three, and four like I did here. Of course, the problem here is much simpler too, the design of an airplane. But the testing is huge. And you as an engineer will be required. You don't just have an idea, put it together and sell it to the people. Oh, shoot, it crashed and killed a bunch of people. Oh no, oh darn it, I'm sorry, I'll try to do better. That doesn't work in this day and age to say this, this country is full of lawyers. It's actually overrun with lawyers, okay? You're, you're done for. Plus, that's not nice to have a, a really fancy design that could hurt people and put it out there without testing. It's really not a very nice thing to do either as a, as a human being. So anyway, the testing is not complete here, but you've got the idea of it. All right, let's get on with um, uh, let's go back to chapter three. This is chapter three, section 3.3.1, page five. So this is page five in chapter three in my book, Mechanical Vibrations View. Here you have folks, certainly one of the most, the most important special cases in all of mechanical engineering for sure, arguably in all of applied physics and applied engineering, one of the most important cases ever mechanical vibrations. What you have is you have a, have a, a mass. It's got a spring-like thing attached to it. That is, the more you stretch it or compress it, the more it squeezes or pulls back. You have a damper, and that's a resistive element. That is, the faster you move, the more it resists your motion. And you have an applied force that you, you put your little hand on the thing, grab it and shake it or pull it or whatever. Our objective is to find the motion of this mass, the position and thereby the velocity and perhaps acceleration if you wanted it, or the derivative of the acceleration sometimes called jerk. They call that jerk, don't they? Well, some students call me jerk, I don't know why. Okay, so how do we go about this? Our objective is to find X as a function of time. X is the position from static equilibrium, almost always You'll, you'll take a whole course, ME3524, that's mechanical vibrations. 
what's the, what's the controls course name these days? I don't, I don't, I don't know. You have controls, you have other places. You may have actually seen this before in your high school physics or physics class because everybody, but anyway, how do you analyze? So what do you, you need to apply the laws of physics, that is F equals MA, to get yourself a differential equation. Now, this is a little tool that you use, a little technique. It's called the free body diagram. What you do is you take your object and you snip off everything. You take a little wire cutters and you snip the spring there and you snip off the damper and you put in a, and, and, and what you do is you instantly put the equivalent force by magic. Now, how can you take wire cutters and cut that off and, and the same force is instantly applied? I don't know, but here it is. Okay. It's called the free body diagram and it makes a great tool to apply Newton's laws, F equals MA, torque equals I alpha, and a rotational problem is one of them. Okay. The free body diagram is not a law of nature. It's a technique to apply Newton's laws and it's a fantastic one and you see it over and over in statics, dynamic, you have had statics, right? You've had statics, right? So okay. free body diagram, I think. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So here we go. And, and once, you, once you get your free body diagram right, applying Newton's law is just as easy as balancing your checkbook. Okay, by snipping the spring off, see a spring is a linear, it's a linear kind of a force. It's a linear kind of a thing. That is, the more you stretch it, the more, more force is put back. K is the stretchiness. K, K is the elasticity. K has units of force per length. In other words, force per displacement. So the further you stretch it from static equilibrium, the more... It, now notice that this, this force could be positive or negative. If in fact X is positive, it's a positive up this way. If X is actually squeezed up, it pushes back, so it does the right thing. Now, on the contrary, damping doesn't necessarily push back or forth, but it is always opposing the motion. You can't like, I mean, if, I mean, if it always helped the motion, I mean, once you started your car going like a quarter of a mile an hour, you got a little friction. Now the friction makes it go faster, then more and more and more. I mean, you could never stop. I mean, you'd crash because you, your car would be going 200 miles an hour, you're going to crash. This always opposes motion. And the, and the classic viscous damper is modeled as a coefficient times velocity. That is, the more the velocity is, the more resistance there is. So C must have units of newtons per velocity units, which are meter per second. This is an applied force. This comes from you. You put your little arm on there and you pull and you yank. Now, now that we have that in the bag, we can now apply Newton's law, F equals MA, I've called X downward as positive. Um, we, can, we can now apply F equals MA and, and literally like a checkbook balance. Here's, here's what I call the cause and effect diagram, which I like so much. The system is composed of the mass, the damper, and the spring. You're, you, what you're looking for is how it moves. And what you're doing to the system is this. You have, you're applying that force and you're also applying an initial condition. Note that an initial condition is an actual forcing function because you have to put your little arm on the thing and you have to pull it or push it to some X naught or, or make it to V naught. You actually have to implement some initial displacement. So it's like, I mean, everybody knows that, you know, an applied force is a forcing, a metaphorical forcing function. But at actual, the initial conditions are also mathematical forcing functions as they are really physical forcing functions. You have to pull the damn thing. You have to pull the spring down and let it go, right? Anyway, we'd like a, to have a function of those variables. But this is key now right here. Mm -hmm. The great Isaac Newton said that the moment of an object, the mass times acceleration, stays the same in the absence of an unbalanced force. 
okay? But the mass times the acceleration changes if there's an unbalanced force. As a matter of fact, it equals the sum of the forces. So if you have an object with a constant mass, this object, that means the acceleration changes according to the constant of the forces. So mass times acceleration, there it is. Acceleration can be written as two derivatives of the displacement. The derivative of displacement is velocity. One more derivative is acceleration. So that's two derivatives of x. And it equals to, look, look at the free body diagram. Things in the negative x direction are negative and things in the positive are positive. These two things are in the negative x direction. They will do the right thing as x and x dot change around. So, so we see here, there's, oh God. I, the mystery of the universe is this stupid little tool that you're trying to use. I fumble with it every time. I haven't figured out the mystery of that damn thing. Anyway, anyway, the, the damping is a negative term. It could be positive or negative depending on the direction of velocity. And there's the spring force and there's the applied force. Thereby, you end up with Love to put a box around that. Oh my God. I don't know why I can do it sometimes, not others. But anyway, there you go. Huh. Arguably, the, you know, mechanical, you know, mechanical engineering analysis. You know, here's a list of some of the famous problems in mechanical engineer. This would be, wouldn't be just one of the problems in there. This would be front cover, right? This would be the front cover. Wouldn't you all agree? You know, I mean, this is the premier example in mechanical engineering. I mean, mechanical engineering is basically thermal and mechanical problems with a lot of electrical, this other. So this is based, this, this equation is half of mechanical engineering, really. Okay, it's a second order equation and thereby it requires two initial conditions. The con starting condition on X and the starting condition on X dot. That is these things. If you don't, if you don't tell the prop, the, the computer or the problem, what the starting position and velocity are, then you don't have a unique solution. All right? So we want to solve that one here and now. All right, this guy right here. Well, we know how to solve more than one first order equation, but we have not learned yet how to solve a second order when the thing has like a second derivative in it, what the heck, we know what to do with this one right here, right? We know what to do with that, but we don't know what to do with the second derivative. So let's go back to chapter eight. There it is again, or chapter nine rather, there it is. And there's a little magical tool there. You could, this, this is, you know, looking ahead in your education, but often this thing is put in terms of what's called natural frequency and damping ratio, omega and zeta. Um, it's never too early to introduce these things. You will be very familiar with this natural frequency thing and, and all sorts of stuff. You'll take whole courses, you'll deal with this all the time. But going back to the original equation, there's this marvelous little trick you can do, or a little process, I wouldn't call it a trick, a procedure. What you can do is define the first derivative as a new variable. All right. So I want to define the first derivative as a new variable. I see I need to come up with a name. Quite often, x is position, therefore dx dt is velocity. So I chose the symbol, which is the first letter of velocity. That's why I chose V. It could have been any symbol. It's your choice. And then when the, with that, you can substitute that back into the original equation. This is the first derivative of V, that is V. And what you find is you end up with a second equation involving X and V. Simply by using this definition of the first derivative back in there. 
I divided by m to get it look like two simultaneous. So what you can do by this procedure, and it works every time, you can always do this, break down a second order ODE into two first orders. And with that, we now have two first order differential equations. See, it's like a, it's like a vector of equations. If, if we can now type these things into MATLAB in this form, which matches a lot of what we did, we can now solve the mechanical oscillator problem. And what we're doing here, and, and you've got one for homework to do, you know, you might think, oh, I don't, the baseball one was, I love the baseball one, by the way, but oh, I don't like that problem, I'll throw it away. Yeah. Don't throw this one away. This one will recur in your education many times. I promise you. Um, make, make this one its own little subdirectory so you can call on it again when you take several other courses in the future. All right. So let's remember this equation and let's try to program. What we'd like to do is program this equation in a similar way that we just did the two second order linear one. This is actually two, two second order linear equations, isn't it? We could actually do this as a special case of what we just did. But let's start again because this, this, this is so important. It deserves its own, own file rather than a special case of the second order. Okay, let's remember this. All right, can I um, grab that thing and copy it? Let's see. I don't know if I can copy out of there. Copy to the clipboard. Really? If you know. Anyway, I, th I think I can remember what it is. I've seen it so many times, but I wanted to have it for the students. Um, let's let's do what we did here. Let's form a function. Rather than this one, let's form a function called linear oscillator, or what shall we call this? Mechanical oscillator. I've called it many times over the mechanical vibrations, mechanical oscillator, oscillator um, vibrations. Um, how about spring mass? Spring mass. Okay, so let's let's open up a new file. function. The output is T and the output of this thing is going to be the X and a vector containing the position and velocity. So sometimes I call the position velocity vector the XV vector. It's, it's not two separate things. It's the, it's the name XV because what's in it is X and V equals spring mass. You know, if you want to be a, this is the spring mass damper. Often in mechanical vibrations, they go for weeks and weeks and don't even put the damper in, or they go half the course before they put the damper in because it makes things more complicated. For the analytical techniques, for us, no. Um, and let's put the variables in. And let's try to, can, can I copy that thing that I just did? Oh, God, it copied. Look at that. I copied that directly out of a, that was a miracle. It never cease. Actually, what I want to do is this. Caps lock. I want to shift to tab. Okay. We're going to try to solve this equation. That's a little bit too much space in there, I think. There we go. I like that. Beautiful. This is missing a DT, what the hell is that? This thing is missing a parenthesis for some reason. And I don't know what the DT has to do with, oh, DX. Oh, D, the DT, DX, DT, DX. DT, I don't know why I copy like that, but anyway, D, DV, DT of that. There we go. So there we go from our analysis. The derivative of position is equal to velocity. The derivative of velocity is equal to this stuff. Damping, spring, applied force, and mass. Div divided by mass to make it up, you know, a first order equation like that. Okay. 
So for our inputs, and let's, let's review what we did over here. Um, we did the time span, we did the initial condition, and then we did the parameters. Let's do it the same way. Let's put in, because MATLAB seems to like to put time first and Y second. Let's do the same thing to make it look as, we got this thing working beautifully. Let's make it look as much like this thing as, because we've already learned this one and got it working. Let's, and in your education, in your life, always try to take advantage of your previous hard work. You know, if you've done something, um, you know, try, try to take advantage of, learn from, and take advantage. So let's do it this way. Now we're gonna to have to change these things are gonna be different different kind of variables now. They're not they're not called ABC anymore. But anyway, let's do it this way. Um, also, oops, got a file and save. Let's see. Edit. Save as. MATLAB plotting. I don't want it there. I want it in the same place I always put stuff for you guys, which is here's my here's here's your class. There are my lectures, and I want to call it the Spring mass, an elongated name, but it, then it's very descriptive. As many times as I've worked on this in my life, if I see a file called spring mass damper, I will know instantly what it is. If I called it untitled six or untitled 4,000, I might not know, right? Some of you, I've seen some of the students go ahead and it wants to call it untitled and they just look sloppy. It's called untitled seven. I mean, whatever. All right. <clears throat> this thing needs, so there's the time span, there's the Y. This thing, obviously, you need to tell the computer what is the damping, what is the K, what is the mass, and what is the force. So let's put in the mass, the damping, the spring, and the force, the applied force. So here we go, we're gonna do the same thing we did. We're gonna put a time span, initial condition, and this time the parameters are mass, damping, spring, and force. Here we go. Let's look how we did over here. Let's look how we did this. And let's model this one. Matter of fact, once you've figured, and, and, this, and, this, and this theme of, of once you figure something out and put a lot of work into something to use it again, one of, you know, I think all of us, one of our favorite sequences on the computer are control C, control V, right? Copy paste. I mean, once, once we've done all this work, why not take advantage of it? So control C, control V. Now we have to adapt this thing. This is not the equation. Now the, now the dy dt. And if you want to, we can call it the derivative of xv because with respect to time, I mean, what I'm calling this thing, see that, why I'm, the reason I'm calling that the name xv, it's a single name. It's, it's got two things. It's going to be a vector with two things, x and v. So this helps to remind me Note, your naming system is fine. I can call it Bubba, as long as I use Bubba consistently through the, the, the thing. But like, it's like confusing, you know? Why don't you try to name things more like what they are? See, I could call this thing Bubba also, or it reminds me that my favorite story about names. They know that um, former um, heavyweight boxing champion, George Foreman? Well, he has like, uh, I think it's five sons or is it four sons? And you know what their names are? George, 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 and George. Now, you know, the man's a former heavyweight boxing champion and I'm not about to go up to him and make fun of him. You know, I mean, that's just, I would not advise you to do that too heavyweight boxing champions and it's up to him you know in that case but I think it's very confusing and if it was if that's around his house is confusing but if it was scientific I think that's a really bad choice you know he has you know whatever you know again I don't argue with a guy like that okay I'll say oh great oh that's great man yeah whatever so naming things is important anyway so here we go this is going to be a function of the xv vector 
So the first equation is what? X is going to go first. It's going to be the first thing. And V is going to go second. It's the second thing. So what goes in the first equation? And just like here, it's going to be D, the, the derivative of the XV with time is this thing. It's a function of XV. So what's the first equation? What's that equation? V is the second thing, isn't it? So don't you pick the second thing out of the XV? Right? Okay. The second equation, parentheses. Divide by, I don't know, I lost my train of thought here. Divide by M, let's do that part, that's easy. You divide by M, that's easy. But what goes in here? What's this stuff in here? Minus C. C is just usually a single number. You know, we're not going to put C as in vector, so you really don't need to vectorize the stuff in this case. I guess it's good practice to always do that, I guess. Um, so what's V? Thing. Minus K times what's X? Isn't it the first thing in the XV vector? X is the first thing, V is the second thing? It's the first thing. That means first thing up. Plus F. Now, for this case, I suppose we could put in a constant F. I showed you how to put in a variable F of a function of time, where F comes in as a, a function. But for the time being, let's don't try to bite off. We, we've already bitten off a lot and maybe more than we can chew. So let's, let's, let's keep the variable F as the next step. Let's keep things so as a matter of fact, what might be nice to do is, is to just, just model the non-forced system, but it doesn't take much more to put in an applied force, you know. Okay, so the XV vector will come out as the derivative of the XV, which, you know, if you really want to, you also could, um, Well, XV, you know, for simplicity, you also, you could call that F, the right-hand side. But what it is, is the derivative of the XV vector. That's why I like this thing. The derivative of, I mean, that's what it is, but that's going to be an error in MATLAB, right? I mean, you can't write it that way. In the description, though, you could do this to describe in your in your comment description. You can put the derivative of this with respect to t. The derivative of the xv with respect to t is this. And I guess I think that might work. I don't know. Do you think we need to test it, or should we just go ahead and and uh, base our uh, senior design project based on it, not even test it, maybe fail? That's it. What do you think? Test it, test it, test it. Test it, test it, test it. Yes, we need to test it. You know, not that I have ever made an error. Y'all have never seen me make an error, have you? Like every Monday ne and Wednesday. Never. Never. never like, seen except you for that. Monday 10 to 11 and Wednesday 10 to 11, right? That's the only times. That's the only times I'm on the law. So I've always said that, you know, part of the reason, I mean, it's just good science. It's, it's, it's good technique to test what you're doing thoroughly. I don't have to convince anybody of that. But also, my, me personally, I have made so many errors in my life that I, when I do something like this, my, my reaction is, okay, I don't really need to test it. I got it right. My, my knee-jerk reaction is, oh, God, what did I do wrong this time? 
Does anybody else feel that way? And so as a result, I'm very meticulous about these things. I take my time. I don't slop around. I don't just start hitting keys. I think about what I'm doing. I try to, although I don't write all of it down, I try to think meticulously about what it is I'm trying to do and what structure I'm looking for and my pencil and paper solution. And partly because I want to get it right, and that's my nature, but partly because I've made so many errors that I know I need to thoroughly think about what I'm doing before I start slapping around in MATLAB and all error and error and get mad and start saying bad words, you know? I know I'm sitting saying, I know y'all can't believe I've ever said a bad word, but I've said a bad word. Anybody ever said a bad word in response to MATLAB problems? Nobody, none of the 400 of you? Okay, yeah. yeah. Every day. Why? My yeah, hand almost goes through the monitor daily. Yeah. You want, yeah. Do you ever, ever want to throw the keyboard out the window? Anyway, I don't do much of that any, anymore because I'm very meticulous about the details. And I test, test, test. I know time is out. Let me just do one test. We, we, we've got to, uh, now, oh, also, let me announce here. We're not going to do a formal workshop again this week because of the Thanksgiving and timing. But I will come on, like, like last week, I'm going to come on Thursday. Is it 2 o'clock? Thursday, 2 o'clock. And it'll be like a normal lecture, like a 50 minute lecture, and it'll be recorded and the Friday people can watch it. So I will finish. As a matter of fact, we're over time. We need to test this crazy thing. And that's just tomorrow. So I don't want to rush it because when I start to, when you start to rush, is at least when I start to make errors. So I will give the very important testing and application of this extremely important problem on Thursday. It will be recorded. The Friday people can watch it. And you have a homework. One of the homeworks has to do with this, right? One of the homeworks is a mechanical oscillator. The other homework is a heat transfer one. The days, this week's homework is like the heart of mechanical engineering. The mechanical oscillator, that's kind of half of mechanical engineering. And the thermal analysis, the other half. Those two problems encompass much of the, of the essence of mechanical engineering. So this week's homework is, you know, really good. It's due, and, and it's due Friday. You know, you have Thanksgiving coming up. And we do not want to give you an, any assignment from this class, at least, over Thanksgiving. Over Thanksgiving, you, you'll get something new when you return on the Monday. But uh, the Friday at 11, is it 11.47 it's due? Uh, or no, 11.46, no. 11, I'm still getting this, you know, I missed it by 30 seconds. Eh. Okay, you have... And we're going to put a, um, Jason and Mohammed, we're going to put a, 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 a email to them, reminding them, remind them, this week is different. It's due Friday, 11, colon, 45. Not semicolon, 11, colon, 45. So if you submit it at 11, 45, and 30 seconds, you get a zero. Okay, anyway, but, so it's different this week, and there will be nothing over the break. Looking ahead, though, after the break, you'll have one more good workshop. Now, then we're badly in need of a workshop. So you have a nice MATLAB grader workshop, and you'll have one more assignment. So you have this assignment due Friday. After the break, you'll get one more nice assignment having to do with, you know, these oscillator, the pendulum, I don't know, so many beautiful, beautiful examples to give you. You'll have another really nice assignment. This one's a gorgeous assignment. And you'll have another workshop. And then, of course, the final exam. So that's what's coming up. That's what's... Uh, that's what the whole semester is winding down. Um, generally, I say to the students, God, I'll miss seeing your smiling faces in class, but hell, it's just a, like this crazy computer, this crazy Zoom thing with a God knows four, it's supposed to be 400 people and there's a hundred of them out there, you know? Anyway, all right, let's, let's quit there because I don't want to rush this thing. Thursday, tomorrow at two o'clock, we're going to pick this thing up right here and we're going to apply this to some mechanical oscillators and we're going to start to understand, test and understand the most famous mechanical oscillator so germane to mechanical engineering. This, this will be probably the single example we do in this course that is going to be relevant to each and every one of the 417 students, 100%, I guarantee, in the future going forward. You will see this again and again. You will probably be asked to do it in that lab. Many past students say, God, that code we did in your class was great, man. I was just ready to go on my, my vibrations homework and da-da-da. I've had a lot of good feedback on this one. 
So the mechanical oscillator is the only example I do every time when I teach this course. It's, it's not touchable. The other examples, like this, I will do the virus this time. I don't always do that. So I'll do other things that are relevant, but uh, the mechanical oscillator is untouchable. It is, a, a, it's always. All right, well, we'll, we'll, I'll quit right there. If anybody has some questions or wanna hang on the line, say hello or, or whatever, you know. Not supposed to say bad word, but I guess if you want to. Okay, thank you all. We'll tune, tune in tomorrow at two o'clock and I'll show you, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let this, this oscillator wiggle and wiggle and wobble around and rock and roll, okay? I think this thing should work. <clears throat>